Okay, so this morning, uh, what I thought we'd do first is uh, see if there's any questions from anything uh, that we've covered, and then Bob is going to open with uh, some lecture, and he'll do a meditation, and then I'll do a meditation. And we're going to probably be, uh, finish at, uh, well, definitely finishing at 11.30. Okay? So, yeah. I have this, like, burning question, but first, there's a book you mentioned about Buddhist economics and author, it wasn't the guy from Villanova, the other one? Oh, yeah, the, well, the original great book about Buddhist economics was by E.F. Schumacher. Um, and uh, it was a seminal book many years ago. And, uh, and then the one that I mentioned to you last night was a man named Glenn Alexandrin, which is kind of not a highly circulated book. My, I don't know if, you know where my copy is. But A-L-E-X-A-N-D-R-I-N, Alexandrin. And there's a few others like that, um, uh, sort of in the Buddhist ethics field. If you look up Buddhist ethics, then you find that. If you Google Buddhist ethics, you'll find more things All right, thank by you. different people. Thank you. And then also, you've made so many references. I've really enjoyed seeing you and Nina. Um, it's not here, but I'm pointing to mm -hmm. her where she was. How do you interact? And um, I guess my question is about relationships, uh, intimate relationships. What's the secret? And maybe even the sacred feminine working with the sacred masculine. Um, how does one stay married for years and years and years and years and have a partnership? I couldn't follow. <laughs> she's, she has a question about the interaction between the sacred feminine and the sacred masculine, and oh. she's interested in particular in the relationship the between you and it. Sacred feminine's virtue, I think, uh, putting up with me for so long. I think, really. She's not here today. <clears throat> but uh, actually, the, we, we say when we're asked that, and we have our 50th anniversary, actually, in a way this year, but formally next year, um, uh, we say that the main thing is that partners in an intimate relationship share a spiritual partnership beyond the sort of mutual desire thing, where they have a, 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 a commitment, kind of natural commitment, but through understanding, uh, to support each other's spiritual development and growth. So it isn't like that the relationship is in some sense thought of as a sort of worldly sacrifice with each one having some different spiritual aspiration, or one of them thinking there was no such thing as a spiritual aspiration, the other one thinking that. So the sort of uh, sense of uh, respect for the others longer term beyond this life destiny or something like that is really key, we, we think. Because if it's just like how much one is, you know, you know the passion thing, the romance, etc., how much one is getting from the other one, then, then there's no satisfaction. And then, then it breaks up and there's distraction and so forth. So we always say that's what, you know, what the thing is up to be now for the better half. And uh, she, isn't, she isn't here. I think that's the true secret, actually, really. Uh, which is why people have these kind of expressions like, the honeymoon is over, and all this kind of thing, and why there's such a high divorce rate. Although, in a way, you know, in the earlier generations, people suffered a lot, basically because of some deep incompatibilities, but then they were held by force, kind of forced themselves, you know. And then that maybe wasn't so good because they were miserable. <laughs> so I'm not against the divorce rate necessarily. And actually in this country, I don't know if you know that, but the highest divorce rate is in the red states, the fundamental states, huh. where they are most uh, trying to suppress women. And that's the highest divorce rate, which is a good sign, <laughs> I think. Uh, and uh, the, the long-term relationship, then again, there's this whole thing and then I would tell you, I think if you were here, that we all have these affinities from previous lives. And um, that's why I always like to tell Americans, if you do get divorced, don't be too nasty to your ex. Because you fell in love once, and you're probably going to another time in the next life. 
Se ne sono più me che te al Dio. E più me che ne hai Dio. E ne sai. Perché tu vedi un fuoco in love again and again and again, e then it doesn't work out for whatever reason. But uh, nothing is ever finished. Nobody who gets divorced is finished with their relationship with that person. And even they die, they're not finished. We're not finished with people. We'll meet them again. You know? We won't necessarily recognize them. But our intuition, subliminally, you know, sometimes you meet someone who you instantly dislike and fear. And probably a good reason to from a previous life that you can remember. And something we instantly like. And that's also from previous things. So you know, it's, a, it's a complicated thing in a way because equanimity that we talked about yesterday and equality means that you should love everyone in a way. But then the idea that there are these special bonds that, that are lifetime, like, you know, geese, cranes, certain birds, you know, they have lifelong uh, bonding, you know, and they, uh, they, uh, it's a big thing in Indian literature, actually, the lifelong infidelity of geese, pairs of geese. And uh, there's something very powerful in that, too, because helping each other through various phases of life, where, which can be difficult. So, you know, there's no one easy answer, uh, there's no overall rule, except I really think it has to do with kind of soul respect, let's call it, S-O-U-L, soul respect, in addition to the physical things. What's that? Great. <laughs> Great. What's that? Oh, thanks. Uh, thank you. Okay, one more question? Yeah. Um, I, uh, I've just been thinking a lot about this, the idea, obviously, of reintroducing into the social context this idea of sacred feminine and the equanimity between male and feminine energy. And obviously there are examples in history of matriarchies, and there's obviously contemporary examples of patriarchal societies, and I'm just wondering for both of you if you have a vision for what equanimity looks like in the balance of feminine and masculine energy. Um, I actually think we have to get beyond gender, you know, and not in the way that, not necessarily in the way that young people are trying to do it today. Because, I, I mean, I, I don't pretend to understand everything that's going on with the transgender movement. Um, but, um, I, I, you know, it's, it's often it seems like it's the rejection of one sex over the other is why people are doing the transgender thing. And when I say beyond gender, I mean, it, it's not the rejection of either one. It's, it's the appreciation of both. And... and um, and the understanding of, of the different strengths that each expression brings and not limiting the expression. Like for instance, often people think of, you know, it's a masculine expression, only a male can express it. Well, sure, let a female express that too. Or this is a female expression, only a female can express it. Let's let a man express that too. I, I think that, you know, if we can get beyond, definitely beyond gender-based roles, and definitely into understanding the the powers that are referred to in yin and yang, you know, the the deep the deep yin, this deep encompassing yin, and then you know this yang that moves forward, you know that that you have to have a balance of both of those in your being, and you you have to be able to express both of them with equality. And I think that's the bigger thing for everyone to get into a balance within themselves. You know, Carl Jung talked about the anima and the animus coming into balance, and he had something there, you know, um, even though he was, you know, he had a whole different set of sexual politics that he was talking about. But, um, but um, I, I think that, I, I really think that it's, it's getting beyond the definition, definitely getting beyond the definitions of cultural gender roles, and even getting beyond definitions of what is male and what is female, and coming into a deeper understanding of the larger expressions of energy that each of the genders represent. 
and everyone learning to be able to hold that with equality. Because if you can do that within yourself, then you will also respect that within others, and you're not going to have the power struggles that you have. That's my answer. I was thinking that uh, envisioning it in a kind of social sense, that's why I recommended to you all that really grim book, uh, you know, Counting from Nothing. I think it's like, for example, uh, if Nin and I had four children, and um, she was, a, she had been a Swedish supermodel in the late 50s, early 60s. And we had a very strong spiritual bond from the beginning. But she really wanted to be with the children. And for her, that was her job that she really aspired to. To her, was her creativity. And then, you know, there's this whole thing about you're just a mother staying at home in the house and isn't that. And then I had a, I was a professor, right? And I had go through the horrible process here in America of getting tenure. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, so I, technically speaking, the paycheck came in my name. But actually, Sometimes when she was not well or in some particular circumstance, I would stay home for a few days in a week and deal with the children. It's a much harder job. <laughs> it's a huge job. So for example, if, if in that kind of situation, if you come home, the, there's money, and it's divided, and uh, you are half of it. And it's yours. And uh, equal, you know, right there. And so then when there's a temper or an argument or a flare-up, it's like, I bring all the money, you know, like the people do, you know, yeah. in either case. You know. mm -hmm. And nowadays, I guess there are some men who do are the household person in a family, and then the women have some job, you know. And then probably they think, I don't have money, you know, I don't see that. And so this, this total in, in, you know, slavery, really, of the women, <coughs> and the complete unacknowledgement about the whole issue of the childbirth and the huge effort that they all strain on the physical strain and it's really incredible. So I think equality is key and then and that's a very huge job on the planet. I think you have to close it, Justin, because you keep it going. You know, it doesn't need to be open. No, the other one. You close? Okay. Um, uh, because these, these religions are infected with the patriarchy. And then they think, well, God is male. It's the dumbest thing I ever heard. <laughs> it's so stupid. And it also it accounts for why God gets really cranky. Occasionally sends floods and fire and gets all freaked out and does all kinds of nasty things. Where's Mrs. God? Well, I'll tell you where she is. She's a ghost. She's the Holy Ghost. Oh, Father and Son. Wait a minute. Where's, where's Mom? Oh, she's a ghost. Poor thing. <laughs> Beaten to death by the patriarchs. She's just a ghost. She's the stupidest thing. We're like, I'm kidding. I'm not kidding. She's really lame. And the Muslims have a similar thing. And the Chinese, really, with the foot binding and all the weird crap they do, still do, actually, when they get back in the villages. And that's why there are so many Buddhist nuns. And, you know, the nun organization was a huge escape valve socially for mm -hmm. Chinese women. Mm -hmm. And so it's real equality. Mm -hmm. I mean, actual equality. Mm -hmm. And I was just thinking this morning, driving over here, how happy I am that you came here and we have a women's gathering, an honor to participate in. Because I'll tell you, women don't vote enough. They're so brainwashed that they have no power. What they think it doesn't matter. If every woman in this country voted, we could, we could drop all the primaries and everything. And then Bernie, you know, Bernie could be Treasury Secretary, I'm telling you, I get after the bank. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we wouldn't have bad governments if every woman voted, you know, especially single women with children don't vote, who most desperately need a strong government and the same government. They don't, they can't get together to vote. And as a huge percentage don't vote. So this group, I hope, has a mission. Each one get at least 100 people to <laughs> on your blogs and your Facebook or whatever it is. Make sure everybody votes, every female votes. It's really, really critical. So I said, I'd like to look turn further thing of what Sarah asked. And that is, is that right, Sarah? 
And, uh, and that is this. Back to the original framework thing that I tried to establish in the day, about this idea of how the revolution is to be able to expand your sense of identification with everybody. So if that's the height of revolution, which, we, which is called Buddha and our enlightenment, then uh, the, the horrible, most horrible thing of it is to be so totally isolated that you're practically like living in an iron cage, you know, and nobody can get to you, you know. But of course you're in prison there, you know, and you're totally isolated. So you have like a gamut of evolutionary forms of, that are good versus bad, of shrunken away and isolated versus totally interwoven with the, with the universe, right? Mm -hmm. In that light, Buddhist ethical rules are given in a marvelous pattern of what are called the tenfold path of skillful and unskillful evolutionary action, which is actually what karma means. It doesn't mean some fate or some sort of automatic destiny or fatalism. It means karma just means cause and effect, and evolutionary cause and effect, you know, an action that causes you to change, a shaping action, which all actions do, right? So if you have that as a scale, vast, vast identification versus you know, transcending the self other barrier versus completely getting locked up in the self mm -hmm. as your sort of evolutionary register, you know? Then the, the three skillful acts, which are usually translated as virtuous or moral, but actually the literal word is skillful, meaning you improve the evolution of yourself, at least to start with, in that, right? So the first is don't kill people or animals, any kind of life. Because taking another life means that's not part of my universe. So you're isolating from the continuum of that life. You take the body, you don't get killed the being because the soul goes on. But you take away their body. So that you, you then become more isolated. And then you perceive other beings as maybe killing you. And you get more, more like closed up. Right? Whereas the skillful thing is save lives. And then when you save a life, it somehow belongs to you, you belong to it. It's part of your world and you have expanded your two lives. You follow me? Yes. Then stealing, what, what you call stealing, which literally means taking what is not given to you. The opposite being given, right. giving. So that's the sort of with, with possessions. Mm. And again, in the gamut of narrowing and isolating versus embracing and expanding. Mm. And in that light, intimacy, the sexual interaction, is not just adultery, it's often too bad, often it's translated that way, stupidly. But it isn't that, the issue of adultery or something. That depends on societies. There are societies where there are polyandry, uh, there's polyandrous, uh, Tibet is polyandrous, for example. Mm. Like one woman often marries two or three brothers to keep them from killing each other. <laughs> 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 Saving land, actually, so they don't subdivide land, it's, in a way, it relates to society, and the earth, and so on. But, but the but sexual thing is where beings naturally and biologically can reach moments of transcending self on their boundary. Mm -hmm. So to use that moment in, with beings in a harmful way without caring about the partner, just using the partner as some sort of instrument is very unskillful. Right. Because even at the time when you, as a human, you have the lesson of melting one into another, you're like exploiting, you're, you're doing something to some other thing, and you're emphasizing the otherness. So then that's terrible evolutionary unskill versus that moment being something to expand your sense of connection and the tru by truly caring for the other equal to yourself, or even more than yourself is even better, because usually your people are naturally self-responsible. Self so so the, in other words, the sort of ethical element of it, the spiritual element, connects. <coughs> connects to the ethical element in a really beautiful way. If you see that being the sort, the progress, the source of evolution, a kind of evolution that is a multi-life evolution, a soul evolution, mm -hmm. if you follow me. Mm -hmm. Which isn't just, then there's no outside being, karma or God or somebody who's coming in and deciding what happens to you. It's the causes of what you bring to these different things, and you do, you are either skillful or unskillful. Right? So to have a long-lasting relationship, each one has to have certain skill. <laughs> Let's say, right? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I was told I was too lengthy. No, oh, no. In my answers. No.
<laughs> and I, I accept it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Do you want to take one more question, or do you want to head well, into there's your... a strong burning okay. question. Yeah. It's in keeping with the conversation. I hope I can articulate <clears throat> it. Um, so, in the intention of holding like a harmonious, um, sacred, masculine, sacred, feminine, um, some oftentimes, and it's been touched on by you, you say yesterday the expression of kind of the sacred masculine within females is more of a wounded female energy. Does that make sense? Not wound, I don't know that I have the words, but maybe it's not, um, maybe it's coming from a female, express, an unhealthy female energy as opposed to a healthy masculine energy. Does that make sense in any way? I didn't say anything about that. But, yeah, maybe uh, not in those words, uh, yeah. What, 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 what's your question? So the question is, what is a, um, uh, an expression of sacred masculine in the world? Well, my answer to that, you, you should answer that better than me, <laughs> but my answer to it fits in, the, fits in this context of expanding your sense of identification. If, if that thesis that I presented here, offered here, is useful, then the female has the advantage over the male, and that the female's expression is more inclusive and embracing. It is more knowing by being, knowing by identifying, rather than somehow knowing by dominating and controlling. And so since you have the advantage, if that's the positive direction of evolution, is to expand your sense of identity and expand your sense of being alive by embracing the life and living as the life of others, in others with others, as others, as well as yourself. Not, not abandoning yourself in a martyrish way, but expanding yourself by identifying with others. If that's so, and if the female has the advantage, then I would say that would be the quintessential female way of going about it. For example, um, in, in uh, this is Philip Slater person that I mentioned yesterday. He has a whole thing about how the hierarchical sort of dominant thing with a pyramid apex and a pharaoh at the top or a general or a CEO or something or a father in a family and then the things going down like that is very inefficient and ineffective in relating to nature and reality because there's a tendency of people looking up the hierarchy to try to present themselves in a good light to the authority above them that they're sort of afraid of. So they tend to distort, if not lie, about they succeeded in this and they did that and this bad thing isn't really happening and whatever. And by the time it gets to the top, it's totally misinformed about what's going on. And whereas the lateral communication and the teamwork of people working together without imposing, well, it's my idea, so maybe it's the worst idea, but it's mine, so let's do that kind of attitude. Mm -hmm. Instead, really sharing and really finding the best idea, letting it emerge. You know, that would be more the female. That's why he connects the feminine energy with democracy, where you really communicate and you, you're realistic and you find out, you know, what really works and what's really happening. And you look at what's really happening around the foundation of the house, you know, instead of just sailing off, you know, in some theoretical direction. So I would, that's what I would say. I would say you know, the women, the sacred female. I, I look at, I'm talking about sacred. Ideally, everything is sacred, and everyone is sacred. And so, in the sense that there's no one of a lower order, something like that. So, I mean, it can be useful to have a little hierarchy in, in it now and then, but, but um, so the reality, you know, sometimes people ask me nowadays, what is Buddhism in a nutshell? <laughs> and I always say, it's, what it is really is realism. It isn't really religion. It's realism. And realism means that reality is good, is goodness, is pure, generous energy of the universe waiting there to be. It isn't a goodness that is imposing itself. It's so good, it doesn't bother. And so one who needs something can draw from it infinitely. And I think the female form is nearer to that aspect and therefore should make it, take, it, take, take benefit of that advantage. Seems to me. That's just my theory, myself. Okay. Can I offer something? Of course. Um, 
um, in terms of you know what is the expression of the sacred masculine? I mean, I think that's a really good question, and I think that one of the things that happened in this particular culture is that men are actually acculturated in such a way as to actually weaken them, because the general acculturating force is to suppress the emotional sphere. Mm -hmm. And they, they're, they're encouraged to harden against their own natures. And this weakens them. And this, that weakness is the reason why you have that, you know, we talked about the yang energy moving forward. That's why that's so out of balance, because that, that domination that Bob is talking about comes out of that loss of power because they've lost Perfect. access to, to so much aspect of themselves. So, you know, the, for those of you that are mothering sons, you know, it's, it's a really important and, and vital uh, goal to preserve that emotional sphere in them so that they can um, be able to express themselves with that natural yang energy, that movement forward, that entering into the world, that accomplishing kind of energy in a balanced way. And so then they can, they can really express that, that sacred process of, of, of the, it, the male kind of generativity, which is a, a, a really a movement outward. And that's super important. If you don't have that movement outward, you have stagnation. And so, it, it, but our problem is because the males are so compensating for this loss of, of their, of their <coughs> natures, they're, they're pushing too hard. So if you're mothering males, really, really encourage that emotional expression. I mean, you don't have to make them into sissies. You know, like, what is a sissy? You know, I mean, anyway, anybody, all, all boys, I mean, I've mothered a son and all you have to do is get out of the way and let them express themselves. You know, I teach a class on conscious parenting, and the main message in that class is how do you allow for your child's highest potential to emerge? And if that's your goal when you're mothering a son or mothering a daughter, but if you're mothering a son, you're going to, uh, you, ha you, you need to allow the full expression of their emotional sphere so that they can know themselves, so that they can know what their highest calling is, what their heart is calling for them to do, and then they can move with balance in the world. So, you know, if we can, I, I teach that class because I, I really, I, I feel so strongly that if we have beings that are manifesting their heart's calling, we're not going to have any problems, you know? So, so you know, this balanced masculine expression comes out of, you know, the full feeling um, capacity that we can encourage in them rather than suppress them, I think. I think we should probably go into Bob's lecture, right? No, it's not a lecture, meditation. Meditation. But maybe you should do yours first, it's about the mother. Okay. You start, and then I'll do second. Okay. You go first. Okay. I wanted to set up the men in our context. Okay. It's special. Okay. But let's let's honor the female. You go first. Okay. Ladies first. Ha 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 ha
form falls away, a new form is born. And we begin to understand that the Great Mother is expressing her tremendous creative capacity through the processes of the earth that are all around us and moving through us. We begin to understand how dedicated she is to these creative processes and to the management of the alchemy in the relationship between the seen and the unseen. And we begin to understand how she is managing the initiatory processes of millions of beings simultaneously. And as we begin to understand her dedication and her capacity, we begin to recognize what an important teacher she is to us. She is sharing her knowledge and her power with us unselfishly every moment. She is showing us how to serve the purposes of the sacred feminine, and she is offering us an example of where our own dedication to these purposes could be. So in this meditation, I would like to explore our responsibility and our desire to dedicate the power that we access and receive through our service to the purposes of the sacred feminine and to the great mother and to the earth. So I'd like to go ahead and do a meditation along these themes. So just allow yourself to get settled. Noticing all the places where the surface under you meets the different parts of your body. And as you do, just noticing where your breath is. Noticing as you breathe in where your breath goes. And noticing as you breathe out where your breath goes. And just beginning to notice the way in which your breath is like a bridge between your outer world and your inner world. And just allowing yourself with each breath to draw a bit closer into your inner world, into that place where everything that you've ever known or felt or sensed or dreamed or imagined is recorded. And as you come into this place, just allowing all of your inner senses to open deeply and widely. Your inner sense of taste, touch, and smell. Your inner sense of sight and hearing. But especially that sixth sense of just knowing. And as your senses open here in your internal world, just becoming aware of the presence of the Great Mother in the form that you have encountered her. <clears throat> Noticing how you feel her presence and where you feel her presence. She's behind you or in front of you, or to your left or to your right, or above or below you. And as you come into contact with her again, just taking a moment to review all of the understandings that have emerged from your work with her and from her teachings this weekend. Remembering how she's opened the initiatory process for you so that you can better hold her wisdom. Remembering where she has met you here in this beautiful land at Menla. Remembering the teachings about 
the creative force that moves through creative portals, and the way that she has shown you about your own creativity and your own creative portals. And just remembering and taking in all of the teachings that she has shown you through all of her expressions through the Buddhist path. And as you hold awareness of everything she has offered you here this weekend, ask her, how can I fully dedicate myself and my creativity to the purposes and the benefit of the earth and all her beings? How can I fully dedicate myself and my creativity to the power of the Great Mother and to the earth and all her beings. Knowing again you may get this answer in a variety of ways. It may come as a verbal message or a telepathic message or you may receive some knowing or some kinesthetic experience. <clears throat> Just allow yourself, with all of your inner senses open, to receive the answer here. How can I fully dedicate myself and my creativity to the power of the Great Mother and to the benefit of the Earth and all her beings? Is there anything that might need to change in my life so that I can fully embrace the purposes of the sacred feminine completely? Continue your question of the Great Mother and ask what needs to change in my life, if anything, so that I can fully embrace the purposes of the sacred feminine. Then the last question, which brings together the previous two, is where can I best dedicate the power of my own creativity so that I can honor the generative processes of the Great Mother most fully? Where can I best dedicate the power of my own creativity so that I can honor the generative processes of the Great Mother most fully? Again, reviewing what you've been offered here and the answering of these questions. 
How can I fully dedicate myself and my creativity to the Great Mother and for the benefit of the Earth and all her beings? What might need to change in my life so that I can fully embrace the purposes of the Sacred Feminine completely? And where can I best dedicate the power of my own creativity so that I can honor the generative processes of the Great Mother most fully? Just taking a moment to summarize the answers to all these questions. Again, feeling the way that the Great Mother supports you in answering these questions. And just bringing these answers back with you now, I'm going to count from one to five. And as I do, just letting each number make your connection and your understanding of these answers deeper, one, stronger, two. And just returning along the same path that you took to encounter the Great Mother here in your inner world, knowing that three, you can return here at any time for inspiration, and for guidance, and for the deepening of your commitment to the purposes of the Sacred Feminine. Four, just feeling the surface under you now. Once again, noticing all the places where it meets the different parts of your body. And you may want to stretch a bit as you come back more fully into the room. Just taking all the time that you need to come back into the room. And when you're ready, just opening your eyes, reviewing your meditation, and then take a moment to write it down. We won't have any talking during that time. with the great teaching of Shantideva, the great teacher of Shantideva. Birth to meditation, okay? So go into meditative mode and try to sit up in meditative posture. With your back straight, as a matter of you're in the chair or not. And ankles crossed, leg hands connected. All right, half closed, right? If you have a good sized nose, if you have a little nose, a little bit in front of you. <laughs> and uh, chin a little tucked, and as if a, a little a string was tugging at the very crown of your head, so sort of pulling your spine straight, but not with a lot of pressure. Just a kind of suggestion of proud 
straightness. It's a good meditation posture. Observe your breath. Without breathing too deeply or too shallowly, leaving, trying to leave it in a normal rhythm. Enjoying your breathing. The wind energy itself coming with the in breath is a stream of energy of Great Mother, Tara. Tara is wind energy. She emerges, she's also a wind energy, going out to heat and nourish the plants. Now turn your attention backward into yourself. Look into your own face into your own body and mind complex to see if you can find something that corresponds in any sort of substantial way to your sense of I, <coughs> the real you. Looking upon your material processes and energy processes, scanning your material structures, scanning your sensations, scanning your ideas and thought streams, scanning your emotions, and sense of presence. Scanning your awareness that is scanning, even. As you do that, you feel a little lost, and then you don't come up with any kind of inner you, a kind of replica of the outer you that you see in the mirror, but in some sort of fixed form. And don't fear that. Let it melt away. And as you melt away, sort of just into being space, spacious, let the world around the you, and it's other than you, usually, also melt from some recognizable form. The world picture you subliminally maintain around you. You're on the surface of the earth, you're in a building, you're in New York State, you're on the planet of a continent of America, you're on the planet Earth, you're in the solar system, you're in the galaxy nebula, nebula cluster. Let that all melt away also. disappear into the clear light of the void, clear light of emptiness, the diamond transparency that is the everything. Beyond the moonlight, beyond the sunlight, <coughs> beyond the darkness, a self-illuminating situation of everything being transparent where there are no shadows, no light and dark as opposites because everything is self-luminous. And 
somehow you are all of it. Blissfully being in the ocean of it. Nothing to fear, nothing to worry, nothing to do. Nothing not to do. So then you can arise just for fun, just because you think of others you know of, who don't feel that way, like being vast oceans, although you know they are. in your ideal meditative form, both body and mind, completely alert, completely present, feeling effortless and balanced, and then look up into the sky of your mind, and in the sky of your mind, to your delight, you see the actual green tower, the great mother in the form of a dark green, forest green car, sitting in a very relaxed way, a little bit akimbo, one leg forward, the other one relaxed, crossed, exquisitely beautiful radiant and shining, powerful green light rays that split into rainbows at their tips and shower towards you. And around her are all 20 other, myriad other forms of the Great Mother. Behind her somewhere, Looking happy to see her as the medicine Buddha, the dark blue medicine Buddha. When all around her there is Isis, there's Vajra Yogini, there's Sri Devi, <coughs> there's Uma, Parvati, Durga, Kali, the Holy Ghost is actually Mrs. Yahweh. Ms. Yahweh Yahweh. <laughs> the Holy Ms. Yahweh. Who is really probably Isis, the Virgin Mary. No end of them. All of them are chatting with each other, smiling, happy to float in the sky above you. And they are so happy to see you concentrating and feeling their blessings and appreciating their blessings. And from their smiles and their glistening teeth, light rays radiate, flow into you, fill you with brilliant light energy, but not agitating energy, balanced, calm energy. Blissful energy, energy that connects you totally to them. And then around you is a vast host of beings, and since you're not, you're present, you're imagining that you're present in all time as well as space, all animals are also there, every single kind of animal, including insects, micro animals, bacteria, the microbiome creatures and all kinds of inconceivable sci-fi creatures, as well as the humans that you know. But all of them at different times in their infinite life have been human and will be human. So you, for a good omen, think of them all as human. And in the front rows of this vast host that sits around you, 
circling around you, your retinue, your entourage. In the front rows are beings that you know or are acquainted with. In the front rows along your left side, <coughs> ranging forward, are all of those whom you love. Thinking of them being there makes you happy. You see them smiling happily at you. You feel so pleased to be, to know them, to love them, feel their love for you. Straight in front of you are all those who you are just acquainted with and you don't have any particular straight feelings for or against. They're sort of unknown to you, but you sort of recognize them. And ranged along the front rows of the right side, of your right side, are those who you'd rather not think about who you really dislike, who have harmed you, or who you fear will harm you, and you loathe and fear them. And they can be from any time in history, some mass murderers, some horrible creatures, they can even be devils or demons. Really the worst kind of beings. You just even feel offended that you have to think about. When you notice all of these beings are looking at you, because they do not see the vast host, the multitude of the great mother manifestations, the great goddesses in the sky, along with the medicine Buddha and the other Buddhas, supporting them, partnering with them, further behind them. But these beings, the friends, the loved ones, the neutral ones, the hated ones, feared ones, all of them are looking at you, and they see you shining and brilliant and rainbow-colored and radiant, just like you see the, the Tara, green Tara, white Tara, yellow Tara, golden Tara, red Tara, blue Tara. They see you like that, like a flood of rainbow light, showering them with light. And the light like, just reflects from you equally to the enemy, the neutral, and the, and the loved one, equally. Because you're just reflecting. And they appreciate it, all of them actually. The loved one, of course, of seeing you happy and feel your blessing. The neutral one is intrigued to receive this energy without really knowing you, but seeing you shining. And the enemy is happy to get your energy for themselves. And they still appreciate it and think you're silly to shine on them since they don't like you. But you shine on them nonetheless. And it actually makes them feel better. And then they feel less interested in being your enemy. So just you bathe in being this nexus with all the great mothers radiating and filling you with light and energy and calm and clarity. And then you transmitting this simultaneously, resonating it out towards all beings, and receiving gratitude and appreciation for your graciousness to them. They, it's just coming through you, but they perceive it as from you. And then you send your gratitude and appreciation to the graciousness of all the great mother goddesses. And this is the set in this setting with this backing and this energy and for these altruistic purposes of illuminating all beings around you there is nothing that you cannot understand there's nothing that you cannot realize there's nothing that you cannot manifest your creativity is totally good totally cosmic it is one with the creativity of all the most admired beings you can add in the range of the beings in the sky, your sky of refuge and blessing and sanctuary. You can add in there all human beings that you know who have blessed you, teachers that you have had, parents, loved ones, friends, beings who love you and have supported you. You can add them all up there. And those who you especially who you admire, that you do not have to know them personally. 
and you see them smiling toward you. And they are all there for you. So you feel completely any previous image you may have had of yourself of being unable to understand, unable to be creative, somehow not worthy, somehow not enough of this or that, is all melted away. And you are just the channel of the infinite creativity of the love of the universe, of the clear light of the void, of the love of all enlightened, selfless, loving beings. It was made in it. And although you are, and then don't worry if you can't keep this vision held in your mind. Just by running through it, you sort of have a glimpse unless you have a very stable mind from long concentration practice. You have a glimpse of, say, something like a green tower or a mother goddess or a Virgin Mary or, or, or Radha, Sita, Uma, Parvati, whoever it may be. But once you glimpse there, you just know they're there. You feel the light come from them. And then you imagine all the beings around you in a vast host. And once you scan over that in your imagination, you just know they're there. You don't have to keep thinking about them. You don't have to get frustrated. Oh, I can't visualize that. Oh, ah. You know, just ignore or bring your mind back to bathing in the infinite blessing and graciousness of the love of the infinite love that is the most powerful force of the universe. The Vajra force. And then you can forget about that setting. But that becomes, as you get used to that, that becomes your shrine setting, your special mandala, sacred circle that you create around yourself when you want to try to go deeper, to expand your awareness, to evolve consciously mind, speech, and body to carry your learning and your insight into a deeper realization. So now forget about the scene and turn your mind toward your own preciousness, your precious human embodiment endowed with liberty and opportunity. And just even whatever your personal belief may be for the moment experimentally, just imagine that you have lived from beginningless time in every different conceivable form. Since infinite means beginningless means infinite, infinite means you cannot exclude that you have not been anything. You have been evil, actually, as well as good. You've been divine as well as demonic. You've been human many times and animal many times. And now, that vast background and you're skillful moving in that background to be more expansive and more connected to more beings. So you're, so you're embracing body and you're embracing imagination, sense of identification. You are this amazing human being. And if you have a greater advantage of that form, you are a female human being. More sensitive, more alert by nature to your connectedness. <laughs> And what a pre precious embodiment that is. At the same time, think of how you've been instructed, maybe, both consciously and unconsciously, that you're not very worthy. That there's not a lot you can do. That you just should sort of be resigned to whatever lowly result or role. And that it's not really possible to get that, do that much, get that much, be that much. And then ask yourself, who told me that? Why did they keep telling you, you can't do this and you can't do that? And what is their evidence that I can't? And how do they know what I am? The Great Mother knows that I can do everything, that I have done everything. And now I'm in a position to do it even better and better by being one with her. The Great Transcendent Wisdom Mother who is not only my 
feeling of connection and groundedness, but it is that feeling as a realistic intelligence, as my intelligence, my intelligence that is critical about the absoluteness of any sense of limitedness and boundary that I may have. Because I do look forward to an infinite future with all the beings, interwoven and interentangled with all life. Limit. And then realize, quickly moving, just like a little bit of an arpeggio, but gee whiz, this particular embodiment that I have, I will definitely lose. There is this thing called death, which, show, which is the impermanence of this constructed thing, which is my body, made of causes and conditions, within conditions. And I will leave my soul continuum, my subtle spiritual essence will go on. It, as a, not as a fixed thing, but as a, as a trans, constantly transmuting and transforming continuum. And it may go from the cocoon of this body into a magnificent butterfly if I'm guided artistically in that direction. It could fall back into some less free form, which I don't want. But the main thing is, I must learn how to navigate this because I will be losing this body, the vehicle of the marvelous sens sensitivity that I have, marvelous intelligence that I have, the memories that I have. A lot of them will, will be lost. So what is it that I will keep through that doorway? And that I should invest in to make sure it is love, freedom, generosity, patience, intelligence, concentration, creativity. And then looking ahead, I, I, I recognize <clears throat> many forms of problems. I realize even if I live in the Trump Tower or in the cosmic Trump Tower of heaven, there will be problems in heaven. Some annoying people will also go to heaven hurt me, irritate me. A mother angel will brush me with their wing in an annoying way. And everything will, there will be some imperfection and dissatisfaction with everything. So I don't really necessarily only want to go to heaven. Actually, I'd rather stay human, rather stay in this place in the center of the cosmos, in the center of the scale where I have the intelligence and I have the vulnerability and I have the ambition to become infinite. And I'm not satisfied with some sort of temporary comfort, impermanent comfort. And then I remember about how to be skillful about evolution. And I realize that every act of generosity true generosity, every act of altruistic ethicality, doing something that because of how it positively affects another, every act of patience and tolerance, not reacting negatively when another is harmful to me, every act of creativity, of not just settling for whatever it is, but always seeing infinite baby steps toward improvement, every act of concentration, every act of intelligent discernment, prayer, receptivity, insight, and majesty, magnificence, beauty. All of these things I must, that I do, creates the seed of that shapes my soul, my super subtle spiritual gene, my soul gene that goes on, that is deathless, that continues forever. So that's where I want to put my focus. And simultaneously I recognize that all these beings around me, enemies too, temporary now enemies, temporary now loved ones, although I want them all to be loved ones, and that's the best. And I want them all to love me, of course. Enemy, I don't, don't, 
might be good, they'd seem not to love me. But I want them all to love me, and I want them all to love all of them. And neutrals, of course. My father was neutral, but they can love me, and I can love them. And then looking at all of them, in my mind's eye, now that I know my own vastness in the past and future as well as present, I realize they have the same vastness. They all come from beginningless universe, many universes, without beginning, infinite. They all go into infinite future. We are all completely intertwined with each other. And they have all been my mothers in previous lives. They have been manifestations of the Great Mother to me in many, many previous lives. I have also to them, but that's not to be emphasized. I want to emphasize that they have all been my mothers. And I must feel the same appreciation and love for them, for their gracious mothering of me. And I must return the favors to them. I must love them with unrestricted and equanimous compassion and love. Even if my mother of this life was a pain, when I grew up, still she carried me in her womb. She suffered to bring me forth. She looked after me directly or indirectly in some way. And finally, I must honor the Great Mother by not restricting my ability to understand her fully, meaning to be her, to embrace her essence, to let, to meld my heart, have a Vulcan, not just mind meld, but heart meld with the Great Mother, which I can only do through opening my intelligence, my intuition, my wisdom, to know all my mother beings and all the mother goddess beings as one being with me, all manifestations of the clear light of the void, of pure love, infinite energy that is available to remove suffering and give happiness, grant happiness universally in every direction. Second, within that, still in this framework, having rehearsed a kind of arpeggio of unity, of celebrating confidently our own full enlightenment through the Great Mother of all Buddhas, who has mothered us in life infinite times and who wants to mother us to Buddhahood, which is infinite life, an awareness of infinite life, and free us from ignorance. We now want to practice reminding ourselves of her embrace at all times, her interfusion, her presence in every atom, cell, and molecule within our body and mind, the super-subtle and every level. We now will repeat together meditatively, very murmuring, not chanting, but murmuring in a meditational way, the mantra that we learned. I'll be a little bit louder so that you can remember it in case you haven't memorized it. Om Dare Tu Dare Tu E Swaha 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 Om Dare Tu Dare Tu Om
montare tutt'ale tu le sarà 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 Montare tutta le tue montare tutta le tue sarà, tutta le tue sarà, montare tutta le tue 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 montare tutta le tue
that males are indoctrinated in social life to express their anger more readily and be more domineering. And if you have brothers, maybe a father, colleagues at school, males will interrupt their conversations. Males will like, be like that. And women are socialized to be more patient and accepting, which actually is a virtue. And I think it's so brilliant what Isa said about that aggressiveness in some of the males is a weakness, actually. So unfortunately, too many people tell women, are you supposed to get angry? And that's the way you find your equality is through anger. And so I want to just talk about that in a, for a moment, because it's so important. And, there, and the key essence of it, I'm going, to use, I'm going to read you just a few verses from Shanti Deva and Kalantar, and recommend that book, of course, to everyone. I saw John Deep had a copy. She was running around with a copy earlier. And it's called Guide to the Bodhisattva Way of Life. Another translation is called The Way of the Bodhisattva. There's like four or five translations because it is a great, great, great classic. Not only about <coughs> anger and patience, but about all, all of the evolutionary practice of improving one's infinite life, seeing to it that one's infinite life goes in the positive direction. But his sixth chapter, which is the chapter on patience or tolerance, which is the antidote to anger or hatred, anger slash hatred, is really an absolute classic. And of course it's a great, it's part of the, what's called the special precept of love and compassion, of the equal exchange of self and other, that is the special gift of his holiness, the 14th uh, to the planet. His whole thing about his religion is kindness, the common human religion is kindness, and all of that sort of stuff comes from this, in a way. It comes from Manjushri and Shantideva, the Nagarjuna and Shantideva. These verses are wonderful. Oh yeah, the key insight is, women should be more forceful, yes, from strength, from the knowledge internally of their deepest deathless reality-based strength, which is unshakable. Actual death, in the country, cannot be, can never be lost. It will never, even if they die, it will not disappear. They will always rest in it. They will bring forth new life for themselves and others, always. It's, it's that kind of strength. And, and then, then from that, there should be the confidence to project more force. But that force should always be projected with the emotional energy of joy, the emotional energy of humor, that means the emotional energy of happiness, never the emotional energy of anger and hatred, based on, which is always based on weakness. And is an, an addiction, it's called a mental addiction, because it's deception to us ignorant beings, is that it's making us strong when we feel weak. That's why it's addictive. When you have a, get in a rage, a tower rage, you feel like it's strong. And that's why it seduces you into, therefore, becoming its tool. But since it is actually deceiving you in your distorted, wrong sense of weakness, it leads you into worse situations. And it harms yourself and others. That's the key of the essence to it. But that's very subtle, the idea of separating force from anger. And taking the force, your force, back from the addictive habit of anger. That's key. Totally key. And he begins, he says, whatever are my virtuous deeds, devotion to Buddha's generosity and so on, amassed over a thousand aeons, all are destroyed in a moment of fury. And talk about relationships. How many relationships have we had that were sort of okay, they were budding, they were ups and downs, it could have been really positive for a while, and then somehow something happened and one really lost it, and was said all kinds of horrible things, did horrible things, maybe was violent, and lost the relationship completely. How many times has that happened to people? I think maybe you guys are nicer than me. <laughs> Two minute times. There is no sin as harmful as hate, anger, hate. No penance as effective as tolerance. Thus, you know, no asceticism, no, no, 
no ascetic called repentance as a victim, it's tolerance. Thus, by all possible means, I should cultivate tolerance with intensity, fierce, fierce tolerance I should develop. In other words, I should develop tolerance to such a degree that no matter what they do to me, it doesn't make me angry, it doesn't make me hate them. It might make me be forceful with them or myself, preventing them or avoiding them or stopping them from doing more, whatever it might be, but never out of anger or hatred, which is possible, actually. And the key to that is it's like, if we understand that anger or hatred will make it a dash thing, because sometimes people want to make anger into a good thing, which it is and never is, actually. So anger or hatred, and you know that it isn't because when you feel it, you feel painful. It makes you feel painful, then what's not good? You know, the angry person feels very stressed. You know, the cortisol is flowing. Very bad for the health and so forth. So, with any addiction, the first step, cigarettes, you know, whatever it might be, is it's really no good and I don't want to do it anymore. And that's, that's a very important step because addictive things, addictive habits, are seductive. They are addicted because they seem to, they deceive us into thinking they are helping us. Keeping the mind wounded by hate, by anger, hate. I will never experience peace. I will have no joy or happiness. I will lose sleep and rise with discontent. But that's how it feels to be angry, right? Doesn't it? Even the Lord whose magnanimity is vital to those he gives wealth and status to, is nonetheless in danger of being killed if he has hatred for them. You know, if he does it with contempt and despising them, even though he's a source of livelihood, they'll rebel and they'll, they'll, they'll hate him back. So it's also it's bad for you, in the previous words, bad for your relationships. Hate, anger, hate, wears out friends and relatives. Though attracted by your generosity, they will not trust you. In sum, there is no way to live happily together with the fire of rage. Anger, my only real enemy, hatred and anger, creates such sufferings as these. But who controls and conquers it finds happiness here and hereafter. So that first part is just developing the result. To, to fashion for yourself the invulnerable shield of tolerance where nothing can hurt you because even something that seems on the surface to hurt you can use to your advantage by strengthening your tolerance. It's a very, very deep thing. It's the only way to be safe, actually. Hate. Now this verse is really now key, moves into another thing of giving insight. Hate Anger hate finds its fuel in the mental discomfort I feel faced with the unwanted happening and the blocking of what I want to happen. It then explodes and overwhelms me. So this is the key. When something is happening we do not like and we sort of grin and bear it but we're very frustrated and the frustration builds and builds and builds. Or it could be some good thing that we want to see happening is being blocked by some bad people we think who are bad. And we're frustrated and builds and builds and builds. And then it explodes. Because we feel weak, unable to affect the situation. We can't make the good thing happen. We can't prevent the bad thing from happening. We feel weak. Anger comes to us in our own voice and says, you know, you can't do anything about this. But if you blow up, you'll have the strength to do something. And then we blow. You follow? That's the mechanism. This will make you strong. And when you feel weak, precisely. That's very important to be aware of. Seeing that, I should carefully eliminate that food that gives life to the enemy. For that enemy has no activity at all other than causing me harm. And here the enemy is my own anger, hatred. It's not the person who's blocking the good thing I want to see happen, who's causing the bad thing I want to see. That's not the real enemy. It's temporarily an enemy. But the real enemy 
is my anger, hatred, that is going to make me. The enemy is probably doing it. The, the relative enemy outside of me is probably doing it because they feel I'm on their way of their happiness. I'm walking what they want to see happen. And they're just acting helplessly, the tool of their anger or hatred. So if I become angry and hatred, it has conquered me, and now I'm just also the tool of angry hatred, and we have this spiral of violence, a cycle of vicious circle, vicious cycle. And this is key. Whatever happens, this is the sacred feminine that you can be and do. Whatever happens, I must not allow my cheerfulness to be disturbed. Being unhappy won't fulfill my wish and will lose me all my virtues. And here's, here's the sort of kicker verse, which I never like how I translated it, but why be unhappy about something if it can't be fixed? Why be unhappy about something if it can't be fixed? <laughs> <laughs> Basically, why be unhappy? And here is the key. When you feel frustrated because the world is not conforming to your wish, positive or negative, whichever it is. And then frustration, you then immediately, right, you use your mindfulness to you recognize, ah, this frustration will build up and I'm going to blow up if I let it go on. So then what you do is you intervene. And here's where the divine feminine's green tower force can come out. Just when you begin to feel frustrated, but you're still cheerful. So then you intervene to tell that jerky guy who's talking trash, you know. I'll give an example. She doesn't hear she doesn't like when I use her example. But she's not here, so I can say, for example, sometimes I'll come in our whole life together, I will come back to a situation where I'm angry because somebody was really stupid and all this and that happened. I'm very frustrated. Angry. I say, you know what happened? And, I, and I'm about to tell her. And she says, well, must have been awful. But why don't you shut up about it before we're both pissed off? <laughs> <laughs> and she says it in a cheerful way. And then, because it's cheerful, at first I want to get more away from listening to me and sharing it. And then I realize, well, of course, we don't want to both be freaked out. <laughs> and later I can come and say it for something important. And I'm no longer freaked out. And it completely she shoots it away. Makes me want to because it makes me want to restrain myself. Because you can't restrain another person who is like being mentally awful. You know, like people who are liberals and who really want the best for the world, for example, the revolutionaries. This is what you said about resistance movements. I think we were talking somewhere. You're right. You know, you could be somewhere and things are happy, and then suddenly the, 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 the professional protester, you know, like a little bit Ralph Nader, for example. Or their own look, right? And it goes around and really how horrible they are, or Chomsky or something like that. And then suddenly all the evil dudes are right there in their room with you. <laughs> and everyone's mad. And then, of course, nobody can think of what to do. Anything positive, you see. So this is, joy is the key. Happiness is the key. Cheerfulness. I think the secret of the British Empire is a cup of tea. <laughs> Seriously. Of course, they stole it from China. They were the Colombian drug dealers of the ancient world. They grew up in India and smuggled it into China because the Chinese didn't want their weird goods and certainly didn't want their cooking. <laughs> they didn't want anything much. And then they wanted the tea. You know. But then, well, anyway, they did that. And then they got their tea. And then, when everybody was all bombs were falling, they let's have a cup of tea. <laughs> right? Although, actually, the people who invented the cup of tea were Buddhist monks, actually, in uh, China, in the eastern part, of, western part of China, upon the borderlands of Tibet, where the best tea grew. And they, well, they used the tea to stay awake meditating, so they wouldn't pass out and fall asleep. Which is why you Jews sit up meditating better. You can meditate right now, but there's a tendency to pass out. So this I just want to share. Because the, the woman in our culture, doesn't play hockey or lacrosse and football, usually, in the old days. It's not socialized to be quick, to being forced. And the key to 
adjusting that balance is not to resist angrily, because then they will bring down more counteraction and violence upon themselves, and also they'll feel bad doing it and make it worse. But to use forcefulness and to break in, you know, you know, every, and use their intuition. You know, Alexander brought up intuition very helpfully. You know, when some, when you go on a date, when you meet somebody, you know in three minutes if they're an absolute moron, idiot, <laughs> feel more, you know, they're, well, they're a Republican, they didn't know that right away. But <laughs> nowadays, nowadays, the old days they were okay, but now they're all messed up. And, you know, but you know right away. And then, but what you do, a socialize to do is bear with it, okay, sure, keep talking trash, keep talking stupid things. Repeat Rush Limbaugh's latest sermon to you. Go ahead. Then, and then you get more and more irritated. Finally, they say something that crosses the line. You blow up. Doesn't it, have, has it ever happened to any of you? I think so. <laughs> so the key there is snap. Do that intuition. Well, I knew that person was going to turn out to be an idiot. Well, then go right away in there with humor. Hey, man, that's so stupid. I go, do you enjoy being stupid? Or is it just a... For fun, or what, what can we do about it? Can we learn something? How about a fact? You know? Whatever. And then they'll either leave, which is good. Actually, my eldest son, who is much smarter than me, he has a motto from Nina. His motto, his motto about me is also very good. I'll just tell you, so he's a father always a little critical of his parents. And he says, that's all I want to read. And he says, my motto is, because he gets it from my carpentry, because I built my own house. And I have a carpenter. He says, my dad's motto is, why do it right when you can do it yourself? <laughs> <laughs> and his motto about Nina is, why be nice to them for a while, only to have them get mad at you later, when you can piss them off right away? <laughs> but it's actually, she gets, all right, all right. <laughs> it's very, she's a little proud of it too, but it's very important for women in our society. And actually, if you're really joyful and you, you're so skillful and you have great good humor and beauty, and so you can, you can get in there to the Donald Trump type before they rant, as they just start to rant and rage, and you can kind of tweak it in another direction by intervening and resisting, but in a humorous way, but trick, but standing up for yourself. And, and saying, I'm not going to tolerate this thing that's going to lead to me being frustrated and then being angry. And either expressing the anger in an angry way and getting more angry from this abuse, this stupidity, or not expressing it ever and then internalizing it and feeling all depressed. Either way. It isn't the anger, you know, it, it, if you express anger, it doesn't make you feel better. But if you are forceful, happily, you feel better. The key is, you never need to start not feeling better. That's the most important point. <laughs> in Shakti Deva's teaching. And it takes mindfulness. It, the, the purpose of mindfulness, you know that thing about, everybody does vipassana, and they, but they don't really usually get to the real level of vipassana, which is where you're looking for the self and failing to find it. That's what vipassana really is aiming at. But the first level of it, which is the mindfulness level, is where you count that breath, and then your mind wanders off into memory, or fantasy, or expectation, or worry. Trains of thought takes it away from counting your breath. Then you suddenly go, oh, oh back to breath. And then you feel bad, your mind wanders, and all kinds of things. But what the point of that is, is to dismount from the thought stream to begin to realize that you have a choice internally. Where's that lovely lady who talked about choice? Oh, she left this morning. Yeah, she's, she's gone. Here. Uh, what? That's Nancy. Nancy, that's right. Oh, too bad. Anyway, you have an inner choice. When you have a thought stream about whatever, you have a choice to follow it or not follow it. You can replace it with a different thought stream. In other words, you develop kind of control. It's like, I like to say, it's like if you've never practiced any kind of mindfulness, which you might have come upon, of course, by nature, not just from Buddhism or something. It's not only by Buddhism. It's, it's in all proverbs of all different cultures to be mindful about your reactivity and your thought and being victim of your own thoughts. 
but it's very specially sophisticated and worked out in the, in the Buddhist psychological tradition. And what that means is that you become aware of the mechanisms of reaction. And you don't think because an inner voice of your own tells you something like, I hate that, I have to say something awful to that person, or I can't stand this, or you know, this kind of thing. You can intervene in your mind and say, well, is, I, is it I really can't stand it? Is it necessary to do this? Is there another way of handling it? In other words, you have the freedom internally to choose between how you're going to, whether you're going to follow a reactive pattern or not. And for that, you need to get yourself a little space, split second. That's like taking 10 deep breaths before having a fight, type of thing. You know, that's without Buddhism, you have that. Everyone knows that. But it's a matter of learning to use it and getting more skillful about it. And then you can do, you can keep your good cheer. Right? This is key. And I think it's key in sort of a practical level. It's the third table of the, of the uh, sacred thing. Okay? So now, that's it. That's all I have. And what you do at the end of this kind of refuge meditation, where like, the two aspects are, you remember all the great beings, the goddesses, the Buddhas, the Taras, the Virgin Marys, the whoever, the great mothers, whatever it is. And you realize that they are all with you because they are vast, enlightened, infinite beings and they are with all other beings because they think they are the same. They only realize they are the same. So all the Buddhas, Jesus, Mother Mary, even God, when he's in a good mood and the Holy Ghost is being a real female for him, balancing <laughs> <laughs> his excessive that macho thing, that they're all with every day, all the time. So they, when you visualize it, you're just being aware of the reality, actually. And then the second component is, you're with all the other beings who are needy like you. Your loved ones, with all the other loved ones, the animals, the insects, the demons even. You're with them all, and you're all totally entwined all. So you create a field where you're in this altruism field, and you're in this grace field where the amazing grace of all enlightened beings and the divine beings are with you. And that's you create that. Now, when you finish that any meditation, you create that before any meditation, whatever it is, and you finish it by visualizing that the gracious ones in the sky, the divine mother, and now meditate, it's not, we're now finishing meditating, they are there, and they are so pleased with you that you have been doing Whatever level of meditation you're doing, if you're counting your breath or whatever it is, mindfulness, seeing all beings as mother, being compassionate, being wise, they're so pleased that instead of sitting up there and sending light rays, they melt into pure light, they flow down to you, they become one with you, and you feel them becoming one with you, and you feel them being present forever in your heart at its deepest, subtlest level, fused with you. And then you don't just hold that up. You follow their example. And instead of reflecting their light and radiating out to all the beings around you, loved ones, neutral ones, and even enemies, and you flow out into them, and you fuse and become one with them, and disappear out of your meditative, special, self-confident state. Mother Goddess initiated, infused state. And then you, and then, you sort of hear in your mind's eye, or in your mind's ear, one of your relatives, or maybe your enemy, or maybe your neutral neighbor, <laughs> say, hey, where did so and so go? They were just shining over there, where are they? And then you're back in your ordinary persona, in the ordinary world. That's very important, to always make that transition, and then be back in your usual self, but hopefully somewhat slightly changed by whatever you meditate. Because your normal self is never fixed. It's always a flow of being. But it's anyway, your normal self. And therefore, you don't get stuck in this thing that some people who get into these kind of meditations do. But they say, oh, I'm Green Tower. Or I'm the Great Mother. I'm not going to wash the dishes. <laughs> I'm not going to pay my parking. Because I'm good at something. We, we get people like that. You have to have resilience and flexibility of identity. And be content to be yourself. You're, you're a bit more habitual self with little baby step changes as well as some meditative mindset. Right? So 
will get stuck in any way. That's it for me. But we probably want to do some closing things. Can I just say a little something? Of course, you do the closing thing. And we don't have to stop exactly. Okay. But it will be good to stop soon. We have to go into a pack clip. I just want to uh, say a little something about anger. Yes. Is that okay? Please, oh, absolutely. Yes, sure. Um, and um, I, I think it is complementary to uh, Shanti Deva's teachings and your teachings. But I, I would like to maybe say something that might sound a little bit contradictory at first, but it's, I hope it's not meant to in any way be that. Um, I think that one of the mistakes that people can make with anger, I mean, I totally agree with what Bob is saying, is you have, to, you have to develop tolerance and you have to recognize anger as the inner enemy uh, within yourself uh, in terms of drawing on the power of anger in order to act. But there's something about anger that is really important, which is that it tells you that there's something wrong. And if you, if you find yourself angry, it's likely that you may have been, either you may have done it yourself, or someone else may have had some kind of violation, may have committed some kind of violation. And one of the things, as Bob was saying, is that women are, are taught to, you know, give it up, give it up, give it up. And if you keep giving, if you, if you feel, if you have this sense of anger and you give it up, you can continue to be violated in a way that's not helpful for you. True, absolutely. So it's important to listen to the anger and then think about what is the constructive action that I can take. And Bob is is uh, prescribing, and Shanti Deva is prescribing this joyful action in a different direction. And I think that's important, but I think it's also important, of course, because, you know, I, I, I help people heal. I mean, that's, that's what I do, right? I try to, my best. And um, so when a person has that feeling, I'm angry, there, there can be some kind of a wound that has been created there by the violation of the other person. Mm -hmm. And the action to take in that case is to heal that wound. That's the first thing to do. And not to go at the other person, as, as, as Bob is saying. But you do need to listen to the anger. You do need to see where the problem is. And if it's coming out of, for instance, giving it up, giving it up, giving it up, then you need to stop giving it up, right? And, you, you, and then that takes courage, because one of the ways that women keep peace is to give it up. And you may have to have a little bit of discomfort to, you know, when you stop giving it up, the other person might be, have a little bit of an issue. And then you have to gain strength within yourself, not from anger, from that joyful place, from that place of deep knowing that Bob was talking about, to be able to stand with courage in the face of their dissatisfaction. And so I think that this is a very useful way to work with anger, in a, in, as Bob was saying, in a skillful way. So I, I just wanted to... I totally that. agree. And actually, this, what you're saying, let me just add to it something, the building again, that I 100% agree with it. And as I was trying to say, that a female must, in our culture, must be more forceful. And there's a way of defining the word in modern parlance, anger, as the name of the force, and hate as the negative thing. So that you separate anger and hate and say the anger part is good. But it's a little dangerous to do that because in the, in the older sort of moralist writings, you know, like all the way back to Seneca in the West, Seneca, you know, the, the, the anger is the one, and if you go into, you know, words for anger in other languages, they all have to do with feeling pain. And so, so the, and the Tibetans, when they translate in Sanskrit, dresha, dresha, which means, which is one word, but it means like to destroy something. And then, but the Tibetans translated as both anger and hate, to, and they made a joint word, shepa, anger, hate. So they, they, if you need to take anger as the name for the force and make it a positive thing, there is a way of working with it, yes. And, and part of the reason for that is that anger very much connects to intelligence, because intelligence is discriminatory yeah, and analyzes what is good from what is bad, takes things apart. So in a way, it destroys things in a way. Intelligence destroys the surface appearance of something by taking the part of its causes and parts and pieces, etc. So, and physically, 
and in, Tibet, in Buddhist medicine, which then leaked over into Ayurveda, actually, as well, although they think they got it from somewhere else. <laughs> but it's connected to bile, which is the heat and the acidic part. Of, you know, digestive bile, seeing bile, uh, there's five biles you know, that function in different parts of the body. And uh, they are the heated part of the, of the metabolism. You need heat. So, so there's a, it, and it would be bad to have no bile. But I have, you know, we say billion, it's a billion personality, it's a very irritable personality, right? We see with you. So Buddhist medicine has it like that. So what you are saying is certainly true. To, the worst thing is to let that frustration happen, right? Being abused and violated. Let it build up even to anger, but be so socialized and so frightened to completely internalize it. And that will lead to sickness, for sure. And so there it's kind of useful. In our in our overly suppressed culture, to to you know let it, let the heat rise, and I, I mean I developed a strong anger habit personally because I had an older brother who tremendously bullied me so much that I didn't even know it until many years later when 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 my mother told me uh, to re when I asked her like what's his problem you know when he was behaving weirdly even at you know at thirty years old. Or something. She said, oh, no, oh, your brother almost loved you. Why, he used to come in when you were a baby, and he used to say, that Bobby, he's so great. Every time I knock him down, he jumps right back up. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jesus. Uh, I never repressed him, but then I developed the idea of S because of feeling weak, because I was small. I developed a very escalating temper, which would make him, like, caution you. Make it back but that's a really bad habit. You know? And uh, so, so, anyway, I 100% agree. Anger has its own intelligence. It is the heat. It's heat. If you can set, oh yeah, I want to tell a story. In, in struggling with that temple, finally after reading Shantideva for years and dealing with things, I was in a situation nearby the Dalai Lama, in a spiritual practice situation, and there was a person. And I won't get to the credit for giving details, but who always used to really be a block and a pain in the neck and cause a lot of problems. And this person was at its absolute worst way of behaving and causing tremendous distortion and difficulty. And, so, and I just felt this heat come up through my chest and solar plexus, and my arms just wanted to choke the guy. <laughs> and you know, they, the, the arms actually just, you know, like a multi arm day, and the arms just want to go. But somehow, I just let the heat go, and there was a, a way of disidentifying from it, and the arms were just relaxed. And this heat flowed out at the top. <laughs> just heat. And then I, but I was able to smile. <laughs> and it was just flat. And he was like, just because there was this big heat, and I think I probably flushed, looked flushed. But I had no movement at all, and it was, it was completely <coughs> separate from me. And I was free of it completely. And then I was able to make choices of certain things I said and did, and I actually solved the problem without saying anything harmful or hurtful or anything to create more resistance and more problems. It was a really marvelous moment, gift of Shantideva, 100%, and of Dalai Lama's own teaching finally registered in a certain way where you really free of that reaction. Very, very key. Not that I had that happens every time since either. <laughs> but it was a breakthrough moment. So that's where you, 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 you force is important. You have to be more forceful always. And you you talk he's just talking about the power of the great mother and so forth. It's really good. And and it's the force of joy and beauty and everything. Great, wonderful. <laughs>